This morning, as we take a look at the first of the seven churches in Revelation, there in chapter 2, we're going to be looking at the church at Ephesus. In the first century, the city of Ephesus was the most important city in Asia Minor. And in fact, it was one of the very most important cities in the whole Roman Empire. It's a very important city. Here on this screen, we're going to put a map for you. If you were to plot out the eight most important cities in the Roman Empire in the first century, this is what it would look like. You, of course, have Rome, the capital city up there in Italy. You've got a few other important cities in around Greece, Corinth and Athens and Philippi, all the way down to Antioch and Syria, Caesarea and Jerusalem in the south. And you notice there in the middle is Ephesus, the most important Roman city there in the province of Asia, this area that is now modern day Turkey. It was an important city. It was a very strategic city because it served as a land bridge between the Middle East and Greece, a very important cosmopolitan, multicultural city in John's day. It was filled with many diverse people from around the world. It was wealthy, uh, boasting a huge marketplace and a banking center. And Ephesus was a religious mecca in its day, largely because it had one of the most beautiful temples in the entire world. It looked like this. It was the temple to Artemis, sometimes referred to as Diana. Artemis or Diana, she was the goddess of fertility. And so they built this huge, huge temple to her. And this wonderful building here actually was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was that impressive. It took 120 years to build this temple. It was huge, more than 57,000 square feet in size. That's roughly three times the size of our entire church building at Impact, about twice the size of an average State of Brothers grocery store. But it wasn't just big as far as dimensions, width, and length. It was also really tall. These columns, there were over 120 of those columns, and they were more than six feet wide and 60 feet high. This building was huge. And of those 127 or so columns, uh, there were a number of those, 36 to be precise, that were sculptured and overlaid with gold. So tens of thousands of people from all over the world would arrive in Ephesus every year to behold the amazing temple to Artemis and to worship her and to purchase her little swag and, and those wonderful little trinkets and souvenirs that marked their pilgrimage to the city of Ephesus to go to her temple. So all that to say, Ephesus was a very important and strategic city in the first century in the Roman Empire. So strategic, in fact, that according to Acts 19, verse 10, the Apostle Paul spent more than two years ministering there. And something that's significant about that, as you read through Paul's three missionary journeys, you won't find of him visiting another city as long as he visited the city of Ephesus. He spent between two and three years there because Paul understood that the city of Ephesus was a beachhead to reach all of Asia Minor. He could reach all of Asia Minor if he could penetrate Ephesus with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as all those pilgrims were coming into Ephesus from around the world, if he could reach them, he would likely be able to reach the uttermost parts of the Roman Empire as well. So Paul and Timothy and the Apostle John all spent considerable time discipling the Christians in Ephesus. And as Jesus wrote individual letters to the seven churches of Revelation, the first church that he wrote a letter to was none other than the church at Ephesus. So we're here in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Revelation 2, beginning in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. And he walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested them who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you have not 
grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you do have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. May God bless us as we study his word together today. Well, Jesus begins each of his seven letters to the seven churches by addressing them to the angel of that particular church. And I mentioned to you last week that this phrase, to the angel of, could have a poss- couple possible uh, different translations, different interpretations. And so he could be speaking maybe to a guardian angel of each of these churches. But another possibility stems from the fact of what that Greek word angelos literally means. That Greek word literally translates as messenger. Most of the time we just transliterate it. We switch the, the Greek letters with English letters forming that word angel. Uh, But that word angel literally means messenger. And so most of the time in the New Testament when this word is used, it's referring to one of God's messengers from heaven. But it also at times can be used of a human messenger. So I believe as the angel of the church of Ephesus is being addressed, Jesus Christ is addressing the pastor or the elders of that particular church. He's addressing the leaders. The letter is delivered to them who will read it and in turn will read it and deliver it to the rest of that congregation there in Ephesus. Now look again at how Jesus identifies himself to the Christians in Ephesus. It's in the second half of verse 1. He says, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. Remember that amazing description of Jesus Christ back in chapter 1? Uh, We looked at a couple pictures last week, and this was one of those we looked at. And if you were to try to depict uh, what Jesus looked like according to those fanciful descriptions in chapter 1, this is probably pretty close to what John saw. But remember, Jesus wasn't so much interested in us painting his picture or drawing his picture. He was making a point with each of those descriptions in chapter 1. And as we look at these letters to the seven churches over the next several months, we're going to see that he's going to revisit several of these descriptions of himself from chapter 1. Here he says, he is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. So he's revealing here his character, and in, in particular, with this description, he's revealing his authority and his power. This description of Jesus here in verse 1 shines the spotlight on his authority and power. He is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, regardless of whether those stars represent angels or represent pastors of churches. Both are true of Jesus Christ. Because remember what it says in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Paul wrote in Philippians 2, Therefore God the Father exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? So Jesus is given the highest name in heaven and on earth, and he's given all authority in heaven and on earth. That's reiterated by Jesus himself in Matthew 28. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the New Testament is very clear that God the Father has given Jesus the highest place in heaven, second only to himself as God the Father. And all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. 
So when Jesus says in Revelation 2, verse 1, that he holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands, he means it. He means it. Jesus holds both angels and every church leader in his hand because he is the highest position of power and authority. So Jesus walks among his seven churches in Asia Minor and evaluates them because he is in the highest position of power and authority. Jesus has every right to inspect and to evaluate every church that bears his name. Wouldn't you agree? He has that right. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is king of heaven and earth. He is the head of the church. He is the righteous judge. You and I have no right or authority to judge individuals or to judge churches and pronounce judgment on them. But Jesus Christ has that authority because he is in the position of having all authority. Warren Wiersbe says it really well. He writes, Only the head of the church, Jesus Christ, can accurately inspect each church and know its true condition. Because he sees the internals, not only the externals, according to Revelation 2, verse 23. In each of these special messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor, the Lord gave each assembly an x-ray of its condition. But he intends for all of us to read these messages and benefit from them. Now, let me just hold that thought for just a moment. I mentioned a moment ago that we don't have the authority to judge a church. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what I mean by that. Every time you and I select a church to be a part of ourselves and our family, it's really important that we discern whether or not that church is teaching the truth from God's word. We discern whether or not the pastor and the children's leaders and the youth leaders are teaching the word of God. So there is a certain amount of judging that goes on. So when I refer to judging here, we do not have authority to pronounce judgment on an individual Christian or on the church. Amen? Only Jesus has that authority. Well, in each of these seven letters to the seven churches, Jesus follows a consistent pattern. After addressing the angel of the church and identifying himself in the first verse of the letter, Jesus does these three things. You'll find this in each of the seven letters. Now, there are two exceptions to this because two of the seven, Jesus has nothing to rebuke. But five of the seven, he follows this pattern exactly. Number one, Jesus begins by praising the church. Number two, he then goes on to rebuke the church if there's something to rebuke. And number three, Jesus makes a promise to the church. So this will be our rough outline. Each week, we look at one of these seven churches here in Revelation chapters two and three. Provides a convenient three-point outline for each of Jesus' churches that he addresses. Here in his letter to Ephesus, The outline works great. Jesus praises the church at Ephesus in verses 2 and 3. He also throws in a final praise in verse 6. Jesus rebukes the church at Ephesus in verses 4 and 5. And in verse 7, Jesus makes a promise to the church here in Ephesus. So let's explore what the Christians in Ephesus were doing right, and then we'll take a look at what they were doing wrong. So let's start with the praises in verses 2 and 3. In the first half of verse 2, Jesus points out three praiseworthy things in the Ephesian church. Three things that they were doing right. Three things that have not escaped his notice. He says he's noticed their good deeds. Number two, their hard work. And third, he's noticed their perseverance. In other words, Jesus has noticed that the Ephesian Christians do many good works They toil over their ministry, and they patiently endure the hardships that come their way. So I think we can summarize those first three praises this way. Jesus is saying the church at Ephesus was a working church. The Christians worked hard. So if you're taking notes, jot that down. It was a hardworking church. The Christians worked hard. We see that in the first half of verse 2. Then he gets to the second half of verse 2, and he points out two more praiseworthy things about the Ephesian Christians that he hasn't allowed to escape his notice. He says they have a track record of being discerning with false teachers, discerning them from true teachers. And they also cannot tolerate wicked men. 
So we find that in the second half of verse 2. We could summarize those two praises this way. The church at Ephesus was a doctrinally sound church. The Christians didn't put up with bad teaching or bad behavior. If you're looking for a new church when you move to a town, I encourage you to go online and read that church's doctrinal statement. If that church does not post a doctrinal statement online, I would recommend going to a different church. They should be very transparent about their statement of faith, what they believe about the Bible, what they believe about Jesus Christ, what they believe about heaven and hell. A church should be always transparent about those things. And so the doctrinal statement of the church of Jesus Christ at Ephesus was flawless. It was a beautiful doctrinal statement, and Jesus lifts them up and compliments them for that. They were doctrinally sound. Now we get into verse 3. And Jesus points out three more praiseworthy things in the Ephesian church there in verse 3. First of all, the Christians have persevered. Secondly, they've endured hardship. And then thirdly, they have not grown weary or thrown in the towel despite how much they've been persecuted for Jesus Christ. So those three compliments, those three praises in verse 3, I think we can summarize this way. The church at Ephesus was a persevering church. The Christians took a licking and kept on ticking, right? <laughs> Just like that old watch that was a big commercial 20, 30 years ago. It took a licking and kept on ticking. That's a good description of these Christians here in Ephesus. No matter what was thrown at them, they stayed faithful to Jesus Christ and did not compromise their sound doctrine. And so Jesus offers the Ephesian Christians these wonderful praises in verses 2 and 3. And then if you skip down to verse 6, he gives them one more praise. That one more praise in verse 6 was that they hated the practice of the Nicolaitans. Now, who on earth are the Nicolaitans? The answer is, we don't know. The Nicolaitans aren't mentioned anywhere outside of the book of Revelation. But the name itself can clue us in to what the Nicolaitans may have stood for. You see, Nike is that Greek word that means victor or conquer. And so Nicolaitans means conquerors of the people. So we could make a, an educated guess that Nicolaitans were individuals that would try to infiltrate a church with false doctrine and once they were able to get naive, younger Christians to buy into that false doctrine, those Nicolaitans would lord it over them. See, it was a, a personal, ego-boosting uh, kind of heresy that they were peddling. They were building their own kingdoms, not Christ's kingdom. And so that's our best guess as to what Nicolaitans were. They were peddling false doctrine, they were peddling heresy, and when Christians bought into that heresy, they would lord it over them. So we can summarize Jesus' praise in verse 6 this way. The church at Ephesus was a church that hated the exploitation of young Christians. Would you go along with that? I think that's a pretty good summary of what Jesus was probably getting at in verse 6 when he said, hey, you hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, I hate their, their practice as well. So if you were to take these praises for the Christians together in verses 2, 3, and 6, I, I think we could summarize it this way. The Ephesian Christians worked hard. They didn't put up with bad teaching or bad behavior. They stood firm in their faith during times of persecution, and they protected younger Christians from exploitation. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Sounds like a great church, doesn't it? If you're hunting for a church, that would be a great church to attend, you would think. It's remarkable that the church was so strong and faithful to Christ. I didn't tell you the half of what was going on in Ephesus, Artemis was the goddess of fertility. So hazard a guess as to what was going on in her temple in a, on a regular basis. You know, everything was going on there. Carousing, drunkenness, orgies. They would have this feast to Diana and Artemis once a year, and they would get so drunk and they'd get in these orgies. Men would actually castrate themselves and promise to become eunuchs in the temple of Artemis. They had some crazy, violent, sensual, and, and just perverted stuff going on there on a regular basis. And the church of Jesus Christ in Ephesus was there as a beachhead in the midst of this wicked city. And so considering their culture, considering where that church was located, they're doing remarkably well, wouldn't you think? 
The Ephesian church seems like the perfect church to call your church home, but the one whose eyes are like blazing fire. Remember that description of Jesus from chapter 1? The one whose eyes are like blazing fire was able to see something deadly wrong within the Ephesian Christians that you and I couldn't see. Jesus looked past the surface and saw the motives of their heart. And as Jesus inspected the hearts of the Ephesian Christians, he found something inexcusable, something that if not addressed would bring about the church's downfall. And Jesus addresses it in verse 4. Look again at verse 4. Jesus says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You have forsaken your first love. So who was the Ephesian Christians' first love that they were forsaking? Well, certainly Jesus was referring to the number one love in any Christian's life, or at least the one who should be number one. Remember what Jesus said to his uh, critics in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, a teacher of the law came to him and said, Jesus, what is the most important law in all the Old Testament? And Jesus responded by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So what is Jesus saying to the Ephesian Christians here in Revelation 2, verse 4? He is saying, you have stopped loving me. Jesus' rebuke here in in verse 4 is translated a, a little differently in a few other English translations. Let me share a couple of them with you. The English Standard Version, the ESV, says it this way. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love... Notice a little bit different here. You had at first. Uh, What about uh, a different translation? What about the New Living translation? It says it this way. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. You see that slight difference? That sheds some light on what Jesus is saying here. He's basically saying this. Christians, do you remember how you used to love me? And do you remember how you used to love each other? Something has changed, and I'm not sure you even realize it. Your love has grown cold. You do so many things right, but you don't do them for the right reasons. You work hard, but there's no love in it. You don't put up with bad teaching or bad behavior, but there's no love in it. You patiently endure persecution, but you don't do it out of love. You protect younger Christians from exploitation, but your motives for doing so are wrong. You're not doing it as an act of love for me or an act of love for them. You see what Jesus is saying here? Do you remember what Paul wrote in the first three verses of the love chapter? That's 1 Corinthians 13. We call it the love chapter. And this is what Paul says in the first three verses. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Think about those words. I gain nothing. Wow, don't miss what God's Word is telling us in 1 Corinthians 13. It's saying it doesn't matter how many good things you do for Jesus Christ. If there's no love in it, then those things are meaningless. They're meaningless without love. And don't miss what Jesus Christ is saying to the Christians here in Ephesus. He's saying it doesn't matter how hard you're working or how many false teachers you're expelling or how much persecution you're enduring for my name. If there's no love in it, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. And in verse 5, Jesus tells the Ephesian Christians, remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, what does that mean? Don't miss this. This is what it means. If the Ephesian Christians don't repent 
and start loving God and people again, God will remove His Spirit from their church and their church will die. Period. Their church will die if they don't repent. You see, without love, a church is dead. Period. Listen to what Warren Wearsby writes. What we do for the Lord is important, but so is why we do it. Just think of it. It is possible to serve, sacrifice, and suffer for my name's sake, and yet not really love Jesus Christ. Labor is no substitute for love. The church must have both if it is to please him. It is only as we love Christ fervently that we can serve him faithfully. Oh, amen. About 35 years earlier, before Jesus wrote this little letter to the church at Ephesus, Paul, the apostle, had written a little letter to them. We call it the epistle of the Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians. And he said this to them in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. He said, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. More than anything else, Paul wanted the Ephesian Christians to be rooted and established and grounded in love. He wanted them to know Christ's love and embrace Christ's love and to reflect Christ's love. And they did at least for a while, at least for part of that 35 years since he had written that epistle to them. But over time, their love had grown cold. We can relate with that, can't we? That's always a temptation we face as Christians to allow our flame for Jesus to flicker, to allow our passion to subside, to allow our love for Jesus and people to grow cold. And we say to ourselves, it's okay if I don't love him quite as passionately as I used to, because at least I'm doing all these things right. And Jesus says, no, it's not enough. You've got to keep that love burning brightly for me. It was probably about 15 years ago that I visited a a local church in town, and I don't even remember why I was visiting for that special service, but partway through the, the praise and worship time, I remember kind of grimacing a little bit, and I thought to myself, man, this sound mix is pretty bad. (laughs) Some of the the microphones of those who were on stage were turned up way too loud. Some of the other microphones were turned down too far. And it was just a really bad sound mix. I'm no sound man, but my ears were hurting. And so I did what many of us do when the sound stinks in a worship service. I turned around to glare at the sound man. Don't you do that? We turn and we glare at the sound man. And so I turned to glare at the sound man, and as soon as I turned and looked toward the sound booth, within one second, I knew what the problem was. Because I looked back at the sound booth, and there standing in that booth was the lady running sound that night, and she was standing up with her eyes closed and her hands lifted high in the air. And I said to myself, well, she's busy praising Jesus. I guess that's more important than mixing the sound right now. God bless her. She's loving on Jesus right now. And I've thought about that many, many times. You see, God has called us to serve him with excellence. And at the same time as we serve him with excellence, to love him with all our hearts. But if serving him with excellence ever detracts us from loving him with all our hearts... I'd say pick loving him with all your heart every time. If good ministry distracts you from loving Jesus with everything you've got, then sometimes we need to take a break from good ministry and just focus on loving him. Being like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Amen? Martha was running around doing great ministry, but she missed the most important thing, sitting at the feet of Jesus. We've got to love on him. Yes, we can do good ministry while loving Jesus. But if your good ministry is distracting you from the love, then his message to you is clear. You need to return to your first love. We need to love on Jesus. Jesus isn't rebuking us today over things we've done wrong. He's rebuking us for doing the right things for the wrong reasons. Our motivation for prayer 
Our motivation for studying God's word, our motivation for going to church, our motivation for serving in a ministry, our motivation for giving our tithes, our motivation for forsaking sin, our motivation for sharing our faith or standing for truth must always be first and foremost because we love the Lord our God with all our hearts. And secondly, we love the bride of Christ. We love Christians. We love his church. It doesn't matter how great of a Christian everyone around me thinks I am. Jesus Christ looks at my heart with his eyes of blazing fire and sees the deepest motives of my heart. He knows whether I'm doing what I do out of a deep love for him and for, or for some other reason. And in love and grace, he turns to me and you and says, remember how you used to love me. Love me that way again. Remember how you used to love people around you. Love them that way again. Repent and rekindle your love before it's too late. Jesus praises the Ephesian Christians in verses 2 and 3 and also in verse 6. He rebukes them for being a loveless, cold-loved church in verses 4 and 5. And finally, in verse 7, he makes them a promise. Look at that promise in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This word overcome is a frequently used word in the book of Revelation. If you read through all 22 chapters, you'll find Some variation of this word overcome used over and over again. It's a key theme in the book of Revelation because Jesus is the ultimate overcomer and any of us who follow him as Savior and Lord will be overcomers as well. Jesus is a great overcomer and he will help us overcome. And here in Revelation chapter 2, we see one of the most important ways that Jesus helps us overcome. Jesus helps us overcome cold Christianity. Jesus helps you and me overcome loveless Christianity. And he brings us back in Revelation chapter 2 to the most important command in the entire Bible, love the Lord your God with everything you've got. Let's take a few moments and go to our Lord in prayer and ask him to restore and rekindle our love for him. Lord Jesus, I am sorry. We are sorry for going through the motions. And we learn sound doctrine and we stay faithful in our church attendance and we give of our tithes and offerings and we use our gifts and our talents to serve. But Lord, so often we've gotten lazy and cold in our motivation. And we've done so many good things for the wrong reasons. Lord, I pray that we would take to heart what you were telling the church at Ephesus here in Revelation 2. I pray that we would take to heart what, Lord Jesus, you said to us in Matthew 22 about the most important command in the Bible. I pray that we would take to heart what you inspired the Apostle Paul to write in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. I can have a faith that can move mountains. I I can have a, a, a martyr's a desire to surrender my body to the flames. I can do all sorts of wonderful things for the kingdom of God. And without love, it's nothing. It's meaningless. Help us to take to heart what Paul says over there in Ephesians chapter 3. That we are to be rooted and grounded and established in love and get to know your love better and better with each passing day. Help us to get to know your love like we haven't gotten to know it in a long time. And help us to embrace that love, Lord Jesus. And help us to reflect that love. You died on that cross first and foremost because you love me. You love us. And may we do what we do for you as individuals and as families, and as a church, first and foremost, because we love you fiercely. With all our heart, all our mind, 
all our soul, all our strength. Help us to love you like we've loved you before and even better. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love this passage. And I needed this message, and I have a sneaking suspicion that many of you needed it as well. Let's not just do the right things. Let's do the right things out of a great love for our great and awesome God who loved us first and gave himself for us because of his great love. If you're here with us today and you've never put Jesus Christ in the driver's seat of your life, please don't drag your feet. Do it today. Reach out to one of our prayer counselors. Their names and numbers are at the bottom of the screen. Let us know if you need prayer. Let us know if we can talk with you about putting Jesus Christ in the driver's seat today. We like to share that wonderful little ABC, step-by-step -step guide to accepting Christ. A, admit that you are a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is God's son and your only way to be forgiven and saved. And C, choose to follow Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, beginning today. If you'd like to make that decision, please reach out to us. And we'd love to walk you through that process of putting Jesus Christ in the driver's seat of your life. God bless you. If there's any way that we can be a blessing to you right now or throughout this week, you reach out to us anytime. I'm available at the office through email or through phone call. Please reach out to me if I can be of service or our staff can serve you in any way. May God bless you as you love and serve our Lord Jesus Christ with everything you've got. God bless you.